What's up everybody? It is Child Therapist Mr. Stu back again with another installment of my series What's Really Going On Here? And today we're talking about Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder or ADHD. Everything in mental health has some type of acronym. There are way too many acronyms. So maybe you started watching this video and didn't even know what ADHD stands for. Now you know. It's Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. And maybe you're wondering to yourself, Self, is he also going to cover ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder? And the answer is no. Why? Because ADD is actually no longer a diagnosis that therapists and other mental health professionals give. Now there's just different versions of ADHD because what scientists found is that really the problem is the same. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today with what's really going on here. What's actually the problem? Yes, the symptom is the child can't sit still or the child is impulsive or the child has difficulty paying attention to different things, but what's really going on here. I'm so excited to talk to you about that. Uh, after a, a brief review of the neurotypical brain, which if you haven't yet watched the full video of my discussion about neurotypical brain functioning, I encourage you to watch that now just so you can have a shared vocabulary about everything that I'll be talking about today. But I'll quickly review that neurotypical brain activity and then we'll move on to talk about all of the symptoms of ADHD all of the symptoms. And I'll discuss with you the differences between the inattentive type of ADHD, the hyperactive type of ADHD, and the combined types of ADHD. That to me is so important because I cannot tell you how many calls I've gotten from various caregivers, whether it be a, a teacher or a parent or a principal or another therapist who basically just says, my kid can't sit still at school. They have ADHD. I want to put them on medication. And I will show you today that just because a kid can't sit still for seven and a half hours at school does not mean that they have ADHD. And then finally, I'll share with you the atypical functioning of the ADHD mind in children, and we'll discuss what supports work best, and even more importantly, why those supports work. I'm so excited. Let's jump in. Let's get going on our discussion about ADHD. First, let's review the neurotypical brain, and I will do this as briefly as possible. Again, hopefully you have checked out the full video about the neurotypical brain, but just as a quick review, down here, this portion with the heartbeat monitor is called the brain stem, and it is the brain's autopilot. It regulates all those things that just happen automatically. Back here, there is the scale that's the cerebellum, and it plays a huge role in keeping us balanced and us finding our way in space and throughout space. Back here is the occipital lobe. Its main job is visual sensory processing. In the middle, there's the temporal lobe. It has a lot to do with processing the sense of sound and the sense of smell. And then this almond here between the brainstem and the temporal lobe, or between the brainstem and the limbic system, is called the amygdala. It's an almond-shaped portion of the brain that serves as the brain's smoke detector. It evaluates sensory information and tells us whether the things we're experiencing are safe or dangerous. Then up here we've got the parietal lobe. It has a lot to do with processing touch and taste. And then the frontal lobe, which has a lot to do with ADHD and what are called executive functions. So things like problem solving, delayed gratification, all of that happens in the frontal lobe. Then we've got our neurotransmitters. First, dopamine, the reward chemical. It goes off anytime we get something that we enjoy. Serotonin is the brain's weighted blanket that helps us just to feel comfort and also regulates our appetite, our sleep, and our mood. Norepinephrine, which is like a steroid in the brain that helps facilitate all sorts of connections, 
but also has a lot to do with stimulating the amygdala and that response to fear. Then we have GABA, which I think I still have not yet heard back. If it is gamma amino butyric acid, I hope that's the case, but if not, we can just call it GABA. And GABA is kind of like a brake pedal or a modulator. It helps to keep things in control. Then we've got glutamate. Glutamate helps all the different pieces of the brain talk to each other, helps make connections, and has a lot to do with memory. And then cortisol. Cortisol is the brain's main stress response hormone. That was a quick overview of the brain in, in neurotypical functioning. But now let's talk about ADHD and the symptoms According to the book that therapists use to diagnose various mental disorders is called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders and we are on the fifth edition. I told you earlier that ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, is no longer a diagnosis. That's brand new according to the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, that book that therapists use that shows us all of the symptoms that someone is facing from a myriad of disorders. But it's so important to understand, I believe, especially with ADHD and a few other disorders, it's not just one thing. There are criteria that have to be met. And if, these, if all of these criteria are not met, then it's not ADHD. Just because a child can't sit still for seven and a half hours at school does not mean that they have ADHD. It could just be that they're a child. And for children, it's hard and completely normal to have difficulty sitting still for seven and a half hours at school. It's important to understand all of the criteria. Like I said earlier, I get so many calls of people telling me that they believe their child has ADHD because they can't sit still for seven and a half hours while they're at school. But just because a child can't sit still for seven and a half hours, doesn't mean that child has ADHD. There are a lot of criteria that have to be met. If not all of those criteria are met, it's not ADHD. It can't be because by definition, it requires all of these criteria to be met. So let's talk just a little bit about those criteria. What are the symptoms that have to be there in order for someone, especially a child, to be diagnosed with ADHD. The DSM-5 has a bunch of different symptoms for ADHD. And the way that it works is it breaks the symptoms down into two broad categories. The first category is a category called inattention. And the second category is a category called hyperactivity impulsivity. Those are the two types of ADHD. There's actually three types. There's the inattentive ADHD, there's the hyperactive impulsive ADHD, and there's the combined type ADHD. In order to be diagnosed with ADHD, children have to have at least six of the symptoms that I'm about to talk about. And those symptoms have to have been present before the age of 12. Let's talk now about all of the symptoms from the inattention category. Children with ADHD often show patterns of inattention and that can come out in all kinds of different ways. Here are the symptoms from the DSM, but I've rewritten them to be in a way that would share with you how maybe a child would present that symptom. So here are all of the symptoms from the inattention category of ADHD. Making careless mistakes in schoolwork or other activities. Difficulty in sustaining attention during tasks or play. Appearing not to listen when spoken to directly. Failing to follow through on instructions and failing to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties. Difficulty in organizing tasks and activities. Avoidance or dislike of tasks that require sustained mental effort such as schoolwork. Losing things necessary for tasks or activities such as school materials, pencils, books, or tools. 
getting easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. That is the whole reason why Doug in the movie Up keeps getting distracted by the squirrel. Doug keeps so that squirrel, I may talk. Squirrel, 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 squirrel. That is squirrel. getting distracted by extraneous stimuli. And finally, in that category about inattention, is that children may forget daily activities such as doing their chores, running errands, or returning calls. They get to the end of the day and all the things that were planned for them or all of the things that they planned to do were completely forgotten. Keep in mind that is a long list of symptoms and at least six of those things have to be present. If the only time your brain went ding, ding, ding was when it was uh, maybe difficulty in sustaining attention during tasks or play, but nothing else resonated with you or your situation or the situation of the child that you're working with, it is likely that that child does not have ADHD because they have to have at least six of those symptoms present. Let's talk about the other category that a child could have at least six of the symptoms present. This is the hyperactivity impulsivity category. And this includes behaviors like fidgeting with your hands or your feet or squirming in your seat. When I was younger, I would play soccer, but I would always be playing with the end of my jersey, always rolling it up and down, and it was a blend of relieving some anxiety and dealing with some ADHD. It could be that children leave their seat in situations where remaining seated is expected. They may run or climb in situations where that's inappropriate. They may be unable to play or really participate in any relaxing activity quietly. It often seems like they're on the go. It's like they're driven by a motor, like they're the energizer bunny. They just keep going and going and going. It could be that this manifests through excessive talking. Maybe the child blurts out answers before questions have been completed. They have difficulty waiting their turn and or they have difficulty interrupting or intruding on others at least six of those symptoms have to be present for a child to be diagnosed with ADHD. At least six from the inattention category if a child is being diagnosed with the inattentive type. At least six from the hyperactivity impulsivity category if a child is being diagnosed with that type. And at least six combined if a child is being diagnosed with the combined type. Not being able to sit still for seven and a half hours while at school is not a diagnosis of ADHD unless there are lots of other things going on as well. And also those symptoms have to have been present before the age of 12. It's great to understand that all of those things happen. And it's great to understand that it's required to have more than just the kid can't sit still. But I believe it's so important to understand why all these things are happening. What's really going on here? Is it just that these are bad kids who should be put on meds and the meds should be cranked up until they can sit still for seven and a half hours? I don't personally think so. So what's really going on here? Why do kids with ADHD have difficulty with their attention and hyperactivity? We know that they have difficulty with their attention and their hyperactivity, but why is that the case? Let me share with you. This is the ADHD brain. 
or at least my representation of the ADHD brain. This is not a brain scan or anything like that. I told you earlier that ADD is no longer a thing. Now it's ADHD inattentive type, ADHD hyperactive type, or ADHD combined type. And the real reason for that is because ADD and ADHD made it sound like it's different things happening in the brain, but really, people were able to discover that ADD and ADHD were the same abnormalities in the brain and brain functioning. It just presented in different ways. So let's talk now about why those symptoms happen. Why do those symptoms of inattention happen? Why do those symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity happen? Not just that they happen, why do they happen? And it all comes down to the brain. You can get this brain diagram, the ADHD brain, along with many other brain models at mrstewtv.com. So make sure to head over there and check out the resources page and download this brain model so that you can either follow along or remember later. There you'll also find a refrigerator sheet that will cover a lot of the key concepts that I discussed today, as well as some tips and tricks and rules of thumb that you can follow as you're interacting with your child or the children in your life to help keep your frustrations low and your empathy and understanding high, but be able to implement those boundaries when you need to. Let's talk now about these abnormalities in the brain functioning of a child with ADHD. Let's just cover the main difference that you see here between the neurotypical brain and the ADHD brain. All of these pictures are much lighter. They're not as vibrant in this brain as they are in the neurotypical brain picture. The reason for that is because all of the neurotransmitters in the brain of a child with ADHD, all of them are low. And those neurotransmitters help the different pieces of the brain to all talk to each other and all stay connected. So because all of the neurotransmitters are low, the brain just isn't really functioning at the capacity that it should. And you can see here that there's a bar graph that goes up and down, and that's also because this frontal lobe, this part that has so much to do with being able to think and plan ahead and not just act on impulse and be able to give attention, has so much variance in it. Sometimes a child can show really high attention when they're playing on their tablet and very low attention when they're trying to read in social studies. And that's because this part of the brain has very varied attention. But again, most importantly, is that all of the pieces of the brain seem to be more dull. These pieces of the brain, they're just not getting the response. That is the real reason why it's so difficult for children to sit and pay attention when they have ADHD. All of their neurotransmitters are low. Dopamine, that chemical that has a lot to do with reward, is low. And so because it's so low, children have this constant need for gratification. That's why they have such difficulty delaying gratification because their dopamine is so low and because it's low, they have a constant need to keep refilling it and refilling it and refilling it and refilling it. So they're constantly searching for, ooh, that feels good, ooh, that feels good, ooh, that feels good, squirrel, 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 all because their dopamine is low and they're trying to compensate for it. Because their norepinephrine is low, that steroid in the brain, they have low impulse control. You can remember that norepinephrine helps fuel the amygdala and also helps regulate where our attention goes. Because norepinephrine is low, children just act on impulse. Because they don't have the ability to regulate their attention, it just goes wherever it seems like might be fun. Because children have low levels of serotonin when they have ADHD, they're susceptible to mood swings. Remember that serotonin is like the body's weighted comfort blanket. And so children with low serotonin are susceptible to mood swings because the serotonin is not able to help them regulate. 
Serotonin also has a lot to do with our sleep-wake cycle and our appetite. So that low level of serotonin causes an increase in sleeplessness and a, a difficulty regulating appetite. There's a lot of appetite change. And then finally, GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. I'm gonna keep saying it that way until somebody in the comments tells me I'm saying it wrong. GABA, that chemical that acts as the modulator, the brake pedal, is also low. So you have children who need dopamine, and in order to get dopamine, they have to give attention to something, but they only wanna give attention for a brief moment to get that burst of dopamine before they feel the need to move on to the next thing to get a little burst of dopamine. And they don't have impulse control because their norepinephrine is low, and they have difficulty regulating their mood, and their appetite is always changing because serotonin is low, and they can't really decide what should what they should do and what they shouldn't do because their GABA is low and so they're very hyperactive and very impulsive and now you have a child who is not just choosing to be fidgety just to be oppositional you have a child who literally does not have the ability to do that their brain is compensating it's not just a behavioral choice of a child wanting to do bad things. There's all sorts of difficulties going on in the brain. You can see where all of those inattentive symptoms come from. Because of the decreased functioning and some abnormalities in that frontal lobe, it's really hard for them to direct where their attention is gonna go. Because their dopamine is low, they're needing to give attention all over to try to bring in as much dopamine as they can, to try to get as much reward as they can. So yes, there's a difficulty regulating their attention. It's not that they can't give attention, it's that they feel the need to constantly be giving attention to different things to get all kinds of rewards back. There's actually a discussion about changing the name of ADHD to attention variable disorder because it's not that children with ADHD can't give attention, it's that they have difficulty deciding what to give their attention to because their brain is not concerned with what they want to pay attention to, their brain is concerned with what's going to give me the most amount of dopamine in the shortest amount of time so that I can feel this reward, so that I can feel good. That's why children have difficulty with their attention. And the same goes with the hyperactivity and the impulsivity. Children need dopamine. And so when they aren't getting it, and then they just feel the need to go and get it, they're going to go and go get it. And because their GABA is low, they don't have the ability to choose where to go. And because their frontal lobe isn't working as well, they have difficulty thinking about consequences on the other side of making certain choices. So they just react, 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 dopamine, 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 scroll, 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 scroll. All because their brain is trying to compensate. It's not just a child choosing to do bad things all because they want to do bad things. What's really going on here is that difficulty and difference in brain functioning. Let's talk just a bit about then, if this is the case, what can be done to support children with ADHD? And really, now that you know the root of the issue, it's not about, oh, a little Timmy needs to sit still. Little Angela needs to uh, be put on medication. Now it's, okay, I know that they're constantly searching for reward and that their brain needs something like that. That is why fidgets work. It's not a fidget works because it's a fun game to play with. It 
a fidget works because it's giving the brain some dopamine. The brain is saying, ooh, that's fun. So now I don't have to use my hands to look for fun in other places. I can use them right here and I can focus my eyes on what's easier. That's why children also might not be able to pay attention and look at you even though they're listening. If a child is coloring, it doesn't mean they're not listening. As a matter of fact, what this brain model shows is that if a child is coloring, they may be able to listen better because what's it doing? It's allowing the dopamine to be coming in through the eyes and through the touch of the paper. And then the child is open just to receiving sound messages. They don't have to look at you to be hearing you. They don't have to look at you to understand. And if you'll allow children to manage their behaviors in those ways, then you'll see that there's not always a need for medication. That children can learn to manage their symptoms and manage their behaviors if they have trusting and caring adults that are willing to learn why those behaviors are happening. So now that you know why it's happening, now that you know why fidgets work, well maybe it's just all about uh, getting little Timmy a chair that rocks a little bit because then little Timmy can always be getting some dopamine from that movement, especially down in the cerebellum. That part will be online and maybe we let Timmy color while he is sitting on his moving chair and then the only thing that little Timmy is doing is seeking dopamine through his ears, which means he's going to listen to you better. Maybe there's a child in a class who just doesn't have the ability yet to be seated in a chair. Could it be that what is fair for them is as long as they can reach their desk, they're allowed to do their work from that position? They're not allowed to go away from their desk and they're not allowed to move their desk, but what if it was just, yeah, as long as you can reach your desk, I'm fine with that because then you're in your area. Because that will allow for that child to be able to get dopamine from being on their feet and feeling the ground and they have to hold their posture and so a lot of these different senses are being plugged and getting some dopamine and so then the only thing that they have to be looking for the dopamine release is through their sight and maybe the work that they're doing or listening to you. These things can help children because now you understand the root of everything that's happening. It's not just a bad child choosing to do bad things because they like doing bad things. There's actual abnormalities happening in the brain and now you know what's really going on here. For some children, medication is a great option and completely appropriate. But I always encourage people to try everything else first. Not so that you have to stay away from medication, but so that you know you've got all the supports in place and you can start with the absolute lowest dose of medication. Then over time, it could be that as your child learns new skills and develops their brain further, they can, with the help of their doctor, come off of that medication or need less in the future. So now you have a full understanding of what's going on with ADHD. That the brain is just not getting the feedback that it needs in order to control impulses and direct attention. The brain is constantly giving attention, but it has difficulty directing where that attention goes. Why? All because of those neurotransmitter differences that the dopamine, the reward chemical is low, that serotonin, the mood modulator, and the, the thing that regulates sleep and appetite is low, that norepinephrine is low, and so children have difficulties with their impulses, and that that GABA, the gamma aminobutyric acid is low, so there's an increase in hyperactivity and impulsivity because children don't have that modulator helping them 
stay in control. And those are just some of the things that you can do at school, at home. Maybe it's that you create reminders or put sticky notes on things so that children know what to direct their attention to. Maybe it's all about appetite with the child that is in your care. And so maybe it's all about making healthier snacks quicker impulses. Maybe you slice up apples and put them in containers so that rather than thinking about all of the work that's going to be necessary to get that burst of dopamine, a child can just open the container and eat. That's another thing that you can try at home. Maybe it's all about just modeling for your child how to take turns in conversation and how to show appropriate behaviors in social situations. I'm not saying that medication is a no-no and that it should be stayed away from at all costs. What I'm saying is that medication should not be the first option and it shouldn't be the only option that's used. Well, that's all fine and good. And now you have empathy and understanding for what's going on in the brain of a child with ADHD. But does it just stop there? Is it just, okay, well, they have ADHD, so I guess they're never gonna be able to sit still and focus when they need to. No, the answer is no, and it doesn't always require medication. There are lots of ways that children with ADHD can be supported and learn to manage their difficulties rather than always letting their difficulties overtake them. I wanna to talk to you about three different ways that I've found are very helpful in supporting children who have ADHD. But beyond just me listing the ways that I've found are helpful, I wanna to explain to you how and why they work. Just how we've taken some time to understand how and why ADHD is happening. I want to share with you how and why these support strategies work so that you can really incorporate them in all kinds of different ways. Let's talk first about fidgets. There are tons of different fidgets. There's spinners and cubes and bike chains and, and squishies and stretchies and all kinds of different things. If you have worked with children at all over the past 10 years, you probably have a list that goes on and on of different fidgets that you've seen. And that's great, but very rarely do I find someone who can explain how and why fidgets work. Not just, oh yeah, it helps if they have a fidget spinner. So let's just check that box. No, let's understand how and why fidgets are working so that you can also use all sorts of other things to achieve the same goals. Fidgets have a twofold benefit. One is just that they use physical energy. So children are using that excess energy that they have because their uh, gamma amino butyric acid is not regulating themselves. A lot of times they have some more fidgetiness and impulsivity and hyperactivity. So having something to just get some of that physical energy out, even if it's just spinning something very small, that energy that's built up has to go somewhere. So it's either gonna be bouncing in a chair or standing up or walking around the room, or you can direct that excess energy into something that is safe and calm and quiet and appropriate. So the first benefit of fidgets is that it just helps use up that physical energy. The second is that it acts as what is called a cognitive anchor. A cognitive anchor is a, a strategy that helps people stabilize and focus their cognitive processes, which is all about that frontal lobe, this piece that has the light bulb in it. The frontal lobe, it's those cognitive, higher executive functioning processes. Fidgets, what they help to do is they act as that cognitive anchor by having a repetitive and rhythmic movement. If you're spinning the fidget, you spin, watch, 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 spin, watch, 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 spin, watch, 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 watch. If you're playing with a marble mesh, it's back and forth and back and forth. If you're using a, uh, a poppin' tube, which you may not use at school, but maybe you use it at home, it's uh, 
pull it out. It might not be that exact timing, but if you watch children play with fidgets, especially for an extended period of time, you'll see that it becomes more and more and more rhythmic. The reason is that cognitive anchor is that rhythmic process. The sensory information that the brain is getting from touch and sight and in some cases uh, uh, smell and sound, it gives the brain a constant stream of input to process, which helps divert any of that overloaded attention, any of that excess attention, away from distractive thoughts or other stimulus. The, the way that you can think about this is it's thinking, well, rather than having 10 small things around the room that are all gonna be a little bit distracting, let me take all those things that are gonna be distracting and put them into one appropriate thing, and now I'm just flooding the brain rather than it having to look in all these different places to get it. A fidget helps to focus all of that excess energy by using up the physical energy and by acting as that cognitive anchor so that the brain doesn't have to be looking in a bunch of different places to get some dopamine. It's, it's getting it all in one spot. It acts as that cognitive anchor. The second technique that I wanna to talk to you about is what is called a Pomodoro timer. And you can use just a regular timer. The Pomodoro technique is just a specific way of doing a timer system, but any timer will do. If, if you have a young child, it might not work, for instance, that a Pomodoro timer typically runs for 25 minutes. That may be really hard for someone who's young. But the way that a Pomodoro timer works is typically you set a timer for 25 minutes. And in that 25 minutes, you see how much you can get done. So if it's cleaning up your room, how much of your room can you get finished in 25 minutes? You are not expected to be finished in 25 minutes. It's not a stipulation that you have to be done in 25 minutes. But what this does is it challenges children to get as much done in that amount of time as they can. It causes them to get a rush from staying focused on a single task. It causes that dopamine to be released from one task because the child is actually focused on getting dopamine by racing against the clock and getting that rush. So if you set a timer and say, okay, you've got 25 minutes, let's see how far you can go. At the end of this 25 minutes, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll go in for another 25 minutes. See if that can help your child become excited about getting homework done, or about doing a task in a classroom, or even about cleaning up after themselves. If you'll set a timer, and maybe 25 minutes isn't the appropriate amount of time, maybe you can tell that this is a task that won't take more than 10 minutes. So you can set a timer for that period of time and say, I wanna see if you can get it done in this amount of time and have them race against the clock. Let them know it's okay if they don't finish within the time, but see if they can. And if you'll push them to do that, they'll be getting more of that dopamine that's depleted in their brain, and they will feel that rush by staying focused on one single task at a time. The final strategy that I wanna to talk to you about today is what's called unplugged time, or sometimes people call it no screen time or screen down time. And unplugged time has been the talk of so many parents and parenting groups over the last several years. How much time is should be allowed for children to be on screens? How much unplugged time do they need? And really, there's no one answer. If the child is used to constantly being flooded with all of this outside stimulus, with all the TikTok videos and all the YouTube reels and everything else, and it's just flooding their brain and flooding their brain and flooding their brain, it's getting bombarded. And then when children have to come down, it feels so bad because there was this huge burst of extended dopamine for long periods of time. And so 
when children don't have that, they feel really down. You wonder why it's so hard for a child to give up their tablet, and it's because that's their source of dopamine. That's their source of that feel-good pleasure chemical. It's not just, oh, it's unhealthy for their eyes. No, it's their brain. It's modifying how their brain responds in different situations because it's flooding the brain with dopamine. So then when the brain is not being flooded, it feels depressed. So when children are on their screens for too long and then they have to give that screen up for whatever reason, it makes them feel so weak and down. The way that you can counteract that is by building in unplugged time to every day. That means you too. You should take some time to unplug as well so that you are not constantly bombarded with that dopamine because then it'll be really hard for you to come down as well. I hope that today's discussion about ADHD, about the symptoms, about understanding that it's not just one thing, but there are a myriad of different symptoms that must be met in order for a child to be diagnosed with ADHD. Then we talked about all of the things that are different in the brain of a child with ADHD and how basically what's going on is that because all of the neurotransmitters are at low levels, a child's brain is not able to give attention in one place because it's seeking dopamine and those reward, those feel-good chemicals in many different places at once. So the way that you can counteract that is by providing the child with a fidget which helps as a physical exertion to get out some of that built up energy and as a cognitive anchor as the child completes a repetitive process that floods the brain with sensory information and allows them to focus on the one thing they need to be doing. Then we talked about timers and how racing against the clock can cause that rush to feel so good about completing a task on time. That's also why children will procrastinate because they want to wait until the last second. So using a timer helps build in that sense of procrastination and that sense of racing against the clock without actually procrastinating. And then we talked about unplugged time and how unplugged time can help a child's brain to reset, recalibrate, find equilibrium all without external stimulus so that when it needs to focus and it needs some more downtime, it can still feel comfortable without being bombarded by all that information coming at it all at once. Remember that you can get this brain diagram at MrStewTV.com. Just head there, click on the resources page, and then click on ADHD brain model. And you can get this diagram along with a refrigerator sheet that will help you remember a lot of the main points, tips, tricks, rules of thumb, and supports that we're talking about today. I also want to take a moment to talk about procrastination. That's a symptom of ADHD that people don't talk about very often. It's one that kids face and it is a symptom of ADHD, but a lot of times people only think about inattention and hyperactivity. But really procrastination has to do so much with those neurotransmitters. Because they're at decreased levels, the brain is doing whatever it can to feel an intense rush of every neurotransmitter anytime it can get a dose of it. So what it does is it causes the child, in this case, to race against the clock. Because that feeling of, oh, I made it just in the nick of time, that feels so much better. It's a bigger dose of that dopamine, of that serotonin, uh, of that norepinephrine. It, it boosts all of those things because there's some danger involved. What if I don't get it done in time? I'll be talking later about a support that can help children with that symptom because it's all about racing against the clock. So make sure to stay tuned for that as we continue our discussion about the ADHD brain. 
now that you understand a bit about how and why fidgets work, that they use up some of that physical energy that's built up in the brain, and it acts as a cognitive anchor, let me explain to you about the first fidget. No, it wasn't a fidget spinner. It was chewing gum. <laughs> Doesn't it make so much sense? N now that you know that fidgets are really that cognitive anchor and that they use up physical energy, chewing gum does all of that. It acts as a cognitive anchor because it's plugging the senses of taste and touch and feel in the mouth and movement. It's blocking all those things so that the receptors are open for sight and sound. It's such a shame that children oftentimes can't chew gum in school because it's such a great fidget. It burns a little bit of excess energy and it acts as a perfect cognitive anchor and allows children to remain focused. Maybe try trusting children with chewing gum every once in a while. Now that you know how and why fidgets work, you can come up with all kinds of creative ways to implement fidgets because you know now you're just looking for something that can burn a little bit of excess energy and provide a cognitive anchor. Something repetitive and steady that can help plug some of the senses so that the senses you need to give attention to are open and able to focus. Children who are in the care of a qualified mental health professional thrive even with ADHD. But it's important to understand that this is a brain difference not just a bad kid choosing to do bad things because they like to do bad things, not just a child who is refusing to sit still because they're bored. It is all about the brain and it's an inability without some supports. Now you have the skills and the tools and the knowledge to offer those supports to your child or the children in your case. Thanks so much for checking out this video. I had a blast discussing ADHD with you. I hope that you feel empowered to support your child. I hope that you feel empathic as you understand that it's not just bad kids doing bad things because they like doing bad things, but there are actual differences in their brain. And now you know some ways to help them manage that diagnosis as well. Make sure to check out the other diagnoses and make sure also to go to mrstewtv.com, click on the resources page and download this brain along with the refrigerator sheet that goes along sharing some key points, tips, tricks, and rules of thumb. I'll see you again back here on Mr. Stew TV. Till then, spread the word, share the love. Bye-bye.